Hello, Internet. So I'm here today to talk to you about the Sierpinski Triangle. Bing! However, our story begins with just an ordinary equilateral triangle. Now, what we do with this triangle is we simply remove a, tri a sub-triangle sort of thing from the centre. We, we make a cutout um, like this. And once we do that, we simply repeat the process on the remaining triangles. Pow! We simply repeat this, and, we'll, and what we get is the Sierpinski Triangle, or at least an approximation of it. One of the things about the Sierpinski Triangle is that it has zero area. The reason for this is that if we start with our triangle from the beginning, say, and let's just say it has an area of 1. When we proceed to the next iteration, and we take out the triangle from the middle, we are taking away 1 quarter of the area. In other words, 3 quarters of the area remains. Exactly the same thing happens when we do the next iteration. We just have three smaller triangles that we are applying the same process to. So, for each triangle, we're removing one quarter of the area, and so we're removing one quarter of the area from the overall shape. When we repeat this process, we're multiplying three quarters by three quarters by three quarters, and doing so indefinitely. The Sierpinski triangle is actually sort of the limit of this process. It's all of the points which survive every single iteration. When you do this countless times, the ones that always remain are the ones that make up the Sierpinski Triangle. And because each time you're recording three quarters of the area, you're essentially going to remove, well, the whole area. However, this does not mean that there are no points remaining. It simply means that the points that remain represent zero area. In a similar way to a straight line represents zero area. A similar but slightly more complicated thing happens when we try and consider the length of the Sierpinski triangle. If we go by iteration once again, on the first iteration, for the sake of simplicity, say that the perimeter, the length around the outside, is 1. When we go to the next iteration and remove the interior triangle, we add half of what we had before to the length, because we have the length around the inside. This process goes on, and there's, it's not as simple as before, where we multiply by a fixed constant each time. But what happens is, each time we're adding more and more, actually, to the area on each iteration, and so the amount the length that we have in the Sierpinski triangle goes off to infinity. This makes some intuitive sense if we know what Hausdorff dimension is. So let me explain what Hausdorff dimension is. We start with our normal understanding of, of what dimension is. We have a line which is one-dimensional. We have a square which is two-dimensional, and a cube which is three-dimensional, and mathematically it goes on but we can't visualize anymore. If we consider a line, one property that the line has is that when we scale it up by a factor of two, it becomes twice as long. But what happens when we start with a square and then we scale that up by a factor of two? It doesn't become twice as big, but four times as big, because it has two dimensions through which it expands by a factor of two. Similarly, with the cube, when we scale that up by a factor of two, it has three dimensions that it expands by, by a factor of two on, and we get eight times the volume. It's like the larger, the larger cube is made up of eight smaller cubes of the original size. If we let n be the number of times in size an object expands when we scale it up by a factor of 2, we get the formula of 2 to the power of d for the number of dimensions 
is equal to n. We can then rearrange this to give d is equal to log of the base 2 of n. This is how we determine the Hausdorff dimension of something. So let's go back to our Sierpinski triangle. If we have it and we expand it by a factor of 2, we find that we have three copies of the original triangle. Hence, uh, n equals 3. And we can plug this into our formula. d is equal to log of the base 2 of 3, which turns out to be roughly 1.585. This makes some sense of the fact that when we tried to measure the length of the Sierpinski triangle, we basically got infinity, and when we tried to measure the area of the Sierpinski triangle, we got zero. Because we see this, if, say, we have a line, and we try and measure it by area, we see that it takes up zero area. On the other hand, if we have a square, and we try to measure the length of it, well, we would find that we can fit infinitely many lines in there, and so it would have an infinite length. So, now that you have some idea of what the Sierpinski triangle is, let me tell you one of the interesting places that it turns up. As happens in mathematics, these things, I don't know, they turn up in unexpected places, and this is one example of that. We have this thing called Pascal's triangle, and yes, that is the same Pascal that we get Pascal's wager from, and it really demonstrates the point that I like to make, that you don't have to be a stupid person to say a stupid thing. Anyway, so we start with just a 1 up the top of our Pascal's triangle. Then, each we have rows of numbers which go beneath that 1. And in each row, each number is the sum of the two numbers above it. On the next row, we have 1 and 1. And you can think of, say, there being zeros outside where the, uh, where the 1 is, uh, like where there's nothing written. Uh, and that produces the ones because it's like 1 plus 0. That's one way to think about it. But anyway, so we go on to the third row and we get 1, 2, 1. The ones on either side is, as I mentioned before, the 2 in the middle is 1 plus 1 from the row above. We go to the next row and we have 1, 3, 3, 1. Each 3 is 1 plus 2, and etc. down the rows. Probably one of the most important things about Pascal's triangle is that it gives us the coefficients of a binomial expansion. For example, 1 plus x to the power of 3 is 1 plus 3x plus 3x squared plus x cubed, the coefficients being 1, 3, 3, 1, the same as from Pascal's triangle. And it works for each of the rows. 1 plus x to the 5 is equal to 1 plus 5x plus 10x squared plus 10x cubed plus 5x to the 4 plus x to the 5, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Moving on, we see the connection to the Sierpinski triangle by looking at which numbers are odd and which numbers are even in Pascal's triangle. I colour the ones up the top in red because one is odd. Then on the third row, 1 is odd, 2 is even, so it's blue, and 1 is odd, so it's red, and so on. We colour these in, and you should see the resemblance. We have a resemblance to the Sierpinski triangle. I can only show you a small number of rows here, but if you continue uh, down the rows of Pascal's triangle, you'll see larger and larger triangles in the centre, and the pattern of the smaller triangles going out towards the edges. Alright, that's all for today. I hope to see you guys next time.